This past winter, my sister Kim and her husband John went to a wedding in Florida. During the long drive home, John developed an ominous cough. A week later, they had both been diagnosed with COVID-19. The progress of their illness dovetails with now familiar media accounts. The cough developed into a fever, and then over the course of several days, into an almost crippling fatigue. Kim, somewhat younger, was on her way to recovery by the second week. John did not fare so well. When it spread to his lungs, he was hospitalized, and a day later he went on a ventilator, where he remained, days turning into weeks. Nobody could go to the hospital. Doctors spoke to nurses who called Kim, who even as she herself processed the information, disseminated it through her network of family and friends. My mom would sometimes cut and paste portions of Kim's text messages into her own, creating a collage of misspelled medical terminology, family vernaculars, and ambiguous pronouns. All we knew depended upon what healthcare workers chose to tell Kim, and this we clung to. Twice daily and without fail, somebody from the ICU called Kim, relating John's progress, which was often no progress at all. But anxious and isolated, these phone calls were her lifeline. The trickle of information they provided, consistent though not robust, fueled her hope, and as important, gave her an opportunity to tell somebody how she loved him, how his kids loved him, somebody who she knew sometime thereafter would stand in the room with him. She had no way of knowing whether her messages would be delivered, but the voices of strangers on the other end of the line were what she had, so she trusted them. The duty of healthcare workers has been to save, but also to mourn those who could not be saved, to bear witness and give testimony. How many have stood bedside these last four months knowing that their eyes and ears were all that was left to mediate between the dying and the bereaved. Mark Twain's parable of social distancing is called, Was It Heaven or Hell? At the center of the tale are a pair of amateur nurses pressed into service by tragic circumstances. Hannah and Hester Gray must care for their sister and niece, each stricken with typhoid foid fever. The local doctor tasked them not only with treating the highly infectious and deadly disease, but also preventing each patient from learning the progress of the other, as the stress caused thereby might overwhelm their already compromised immune systems. Twain always insisted that was it heaven or hell was based upon real events, but he never could quite keep straight exactly which real events it was based upon. The author was often shifty on questions of method and source material but that the story could have been based on any number of episodes in his life or the lives of his close friends also captures the extent to which he succeeded in composing a story whose content would be broadly familiar to readers of his time. After Was It Heaven or Hell was published in the popular Christmas issue of Harper's, the magazine received a stream of letters from grief-stricken survivors, convinced that Twain was reproducing scenes from their own family tragedies. By the time the Harper's issue was available to the public, it was a story more true than when Twain had written it. The preceding August, just after Twain finished the story, his wife, Livy Clemens, had suffered shortness of breath so debilitating they both became convinced she would die. And she never really recovered. For the next 22 months, the Clemens household would include a series of doctors and nurses. And from the start, the expensive specialist Sam summoned from Boston and New York failed to make sense of Livy's symptoms. It has been one continual guess, 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 change, 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 from one incompetent drug to another and from one un indigestible food to another, he wrote to Henry Rogers. It seems stupid to keep a student four years in medical college to merely learn how to guess and guess wrong. Lacking any more reliable diagnosis, the doctors were increasingly intent on prescribing the rest cure, as was customary, particularly when the patient was a woman. To their credit, both Livia and her family resisted, 
Sam, Clara, and Livy's sister, Susan Crane, took turns firing the doctors and nurses who tried to bar the family from the sick room. They eventually agreed to visit one at a time, and then, just like the characters in Was It Heaven or Hell, not to talk about anything that was likely to excite the patient. Twain reported, We guard her against feeling and thinking all we can. By mid-September, with Livy worsening, the family's will to resist was failing. A compromise was reached. Clara and Susan would be allowed to come and go as long as they promised to remain calm when in Livy's presence. All agreed that Sam could not be trusted to adhere to these guidelines, so he was banished. Sam felt betrayed, but when even Livy agreed to the conditions, he relented and entered his self-described purgatory where he would remain for most of the next four months. He pitied himself for being excluded from Livy's company when any day could be her last, but reconciled himself by trying to believe that by obeying the doctor's orders, he was protecting her. He took up residence in an adjoining room from whence he could slip notes under the door. After more than three decades of marriage, Sam and Livy became pen pals again, as they had been during their courtship. Sam adhered to the prescriptions of was it heaven or hell, never sending any bad news, even as several of their friends fell ill and died. Mrs. Clemens lives in a world where no sorrows come from without, he wrote, a blessed ignorance which sometimes seems a compensation for her captivity. The whole household had been developing their capacity for withholding and outright lying, but their talents were tested when the youngest Clemens, Jean, fell ill. Jean had also been banished from Livy's bedside. Her mother, even in the best of times, was prone to worry over Jean's epilepsy, searching for signs of seizure in her daughter's every expression and gesture. Clara and the one nurse continued their now months-long sentry at Livy's side, making excuses for why Livy could not hear Jean practicing the piano as usual. Another nurse and Sam stood watch over Jean, who looked, as he put it, like a survivor of a forest fire. During his shift, Twain composed a series of long, dismal letters, ending one by saying, pious maniacs are in the habit of regarding life as a boon and trying to be grateful for it. How many households around the world are simultaneously gripped by some variation of this vigil? How many more will be before our watch is lifted? Like Twain, I don't know who to pity more. The severely ill are those who wait upon them, those who are deciding how and when their families should be separated, and those who, standing at a hospital threshold, tell fathers, brothers, daughters, you can go no further, we'll call you. Nearly two weeks after he entered the ICU, John's temperature broke. Two days later, he was off the ventilator, and the, though he couldn't speak, the nurses used iPads to allow him to video conference with Kim and his kids. After nearly two months in the hospital, he returned home, still unable to walk more than a few yards at a time. His recovery is steady, but ongoing. Jean Clemens's fever broke on December, December 30th, 1902. And though she would be bedridden for another week, the doctors were sure she would eventually have a full recovery. On the 35th anniversary of their first date, Sam was allowed to spend five minutes with Libby. On New Year's Day, she slipped a greeting under his door, and when they saw each other that evening, for four minutes, he found her in great spirits, just like 35 years ago. He wrote in his notebook, Only he who has seen better days and lives to see better days again, knows their full value.